Welcome back, beautiful people. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sams. Now, today we're chatting about space tourism and space travel with my good friend, astronaut Pure Wimmer. Now, 2021 was a historical year for commercial space travel. A record number of civilian orbital and suborbital missions launched very successfully. Elon Musk's SpaceX launched four amateur astronauts into Earth's orbit for the first time. A Russian film crew spent 12 days on the International Space Station shooting the world's first movie in space. And two multi-billionaires flew to the edge of Earth's atmosphere as the first passengers of their respective space companies to show the public that their new spacecrafts are safe and fun. And as with everything in its early stages, space tourism today is unattainably expensive. Although demand appears to be strong enough to keep existing companies in this market busy for several years. But eventually, as technology matures and more companies enter the industry, prices will hopefully go down. Going to space in the future will be more like picking a trip to Europe. This past summer, Virgin Galactic's founder, Sir Richard Branson, became its first passenger and flew to the edge of Earth's atmosphere in a VSS Unity Spaceship 2 space plane, along with two pilots and three Virgin Galactic employees. A pioneer in the space tourism industry, Virgin Galactic began selling seats in 2013 at $250,000 apiece. By the time it halted sales in 2014, after a test flight failure, the company had collected deposits from more than 600 aspiring customers. Now, ticket sales resumed in August of 2021, but at a much higher price, this time $450,000. Virgin Galactic said it has since received 100 reservations. Now, each VSS Unity Spaceship 2 can carry up to four passengers. Virgin expects to fly paying passengers three times a month in 2023. At its current reservation volume, it's going to take the company a number of years to clear its wait list. So patience is your friend here. Pierre Wimmer is a founding astronaut with Sir Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic since 2005, and he will be on one of the first commercial rocket flights to space. But going into space is not like just taking a high-speed jet across the world. Pierre has successfully completed his space training, including weightlessness, zero-G training, and he's also flown Russian MiG-25 and L-39 fighter jets. He's a real pro. Welcome to the show, Superstar. Nice to have you back on. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> nice to have you back on, and congrats on winning the 21st Century Icon Awards. Thank you very much. Great, greatly appreciate it. Quite the, a experience. quite the accomplishment I mean, for your services to charity, adventure, space, and finance. They couldn't have picked a better, more seasoned individual. So my, my hat goes off to you, Pierre. Thank you very much. Now we'll talk space. Let's talk about, let's walk us through as an astronaut. The first thing I'd love to know is what effects does space flight have on one's body? Uh, well, first and foremost, you're going to feel a lot of G forces uh, hitting your your chest on the way up there. Uh, it is not, and it will never be uh, like go, jumping on a Boeing 747 flying from London to New York. It, it's just the simple mathematics and physics uh, involved in space travel. When you got to leave the Earth's gravity zone, as it were, you, you've got to deploy so much uh, energy release uh, that you'll really feel it on the body. So, for for me personally. I've been training and uh, through through the centrifuge and, and also through the so-called vomit comet, uh, the, the weightlessness flight, uh, to get my body used to uh, these extra G-forces on the body. And we have to carry a G-load of 6GX, meaning the, the equivalent of lying on the floor and having six grand adults standing on top of your chest. That's sort of the equivalent pressure that you your body get exposed to when flying into space. At the same time, you also get GZ forces pulling blood out of your head effectively um, at a G load of three. So uh, so at the peak, uh, we'll certainly feel it. Uh, but that's what we trained for. And uh, I'm fully ready for for that exposure. Absolutely. I mean, look, a, norm, a normal body will adapt to the abnormal environment of space in many ways. And I would assume that, you know, immediately upon entering zero gravity, fluids probably, you know, in your legs and in the lower part of your body move upwards towards your head. So I, I, can't, I can't imagine that people's faces do look swollen. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, they can, depending on, on what part of the, uh, of, of the space flight you're at. Uh, certainly, uh, you can go into a situation where you get more blood in your head, 
uh, and other times you get less blood in your head. Um, like I said, when, when you go into space, you, you're sort of putting negative GZ. So blood will will flow out of your head. And the, and the key thing here is to stay uh, stay awake, stay fresh. Uh, and, and we as astronauts learn certain um, uh, training exercises to effectively try to block the uh, the blood circulations in order to keep as much blood up in in, in the head compartment as it were um as much as possible we also do that when you fly fighter jets so you you refer to my uh, mig 25 and l39's flight um particularly the l39's we do a lot of acrobatics um those are particularly good exercises uh, getting used to g-forces and and how to handle it and it's also good to know before you go to space how much your body can can handle and when to level up etc oh yeah beautiful stuff this is very fascinating um my next question is what should one study in school if they want to become an astronaut I think first and foremost, you should, um, may, you know, if that's your dream to go into space, then fight for it, work for it, put all your passion and, and heart into it, and you will succeed one way or another. Um, but basically, there are two paths here. You can either go the um, public uh, astronaut way or the official way. I, if you're American, you can apply for the for NASA, or indeed, if you're in, in Europe, you can become part of the uh, ESA, uh, European Space Agency Astronaut Corps. Uh, or indeed uh, China or India, et cetera. But yeah. if you're uh, unlucky and you're in a country where they don't have these sort of things, then uh, go private. Um, go private. Yeah, go private. That's uh, that's probably a safer bet to do it. So try to get involved in some businesses that allow you to afford uh, buying a private ticket to space. Good news is, I think over time, these will become cheaper. Um, you mentioned the prices at the intro. <clears throat> those are not for everybody. But over time, and give it another five to 10 years, those prices will come down. Like any other private industry, you get more competition, more offerings, a high end, a low end, etc. cetera. And uh, who knows, um, you might just get your chance to go into space. There you go. Now, one worrying side effect of space exploration is that we might end up making <laughs> as much of a mess of the rest of the universe as we have done of our own home planet. And it's estimated that there are already up to 8,000 tons of debris from previous space missions and now um, defunct satellites floating in Earth's orbit. What measures uh, and are there any technologies out there um, that will help this cleanup process? You're absolutely right. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, space debris floating around up, up there. Um, about 10% of the total of space debris actually came from one coalition, collision between a Russian satellite and a, uh, an American satellite uh, some years ago. And, and in more recent times, uh, the Russians uh, deliberately fired at, at one of their own satellites um, to sort of test out uh, military, military capabilities. That added also to the space debris, very sadly. Um, there are companies uh, that are looking to create technologies where you can sort of hoover up um, space debris and, and therefore collect it and, and, and therefore minimize uh, the, the debris. It is very dangerous. I mean, even a little screwdriver, um, which on planet Earth is not particularly dangerous, but if it's flying in space at 25,000 miles per hour, I mean, that can go straight through a person's body if a space astronaut is doing an, an EVA. Or even uh, the International Space Station, it can it can go straight through uh, through the station. So a screwdriver, as little as that, can be a very very dangerous object in space. Um, yeah, who would have ever thought? About... Who would have ever thought that that could be the end of your life with a screwdriver? So with that in mind, um, I know that launched this year, Elsa D, which is end of life services by Astroscale um, demonstration. Their mission is to clean up debris that's going to be left in space by future space missions. Um, and and it was very interesting, just exactly to what you just said. It does this using magnets to grab floating debris and push them towards the earth well, where, where it will burn up in the outer layers of the atmosphere. So that's an interesting waste disposal uh, mechanism. Now we have less than a minute left and I just wanted to get a little bit more insight. Um, very quick question. When you go to space, how do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> it's always a tricky question. If you're on the internet, uh, on a, a, a space shuttle, or indeed on the International Space Station, there are actually uh, dedicated toilets, um, and where you take a, a tube and you do what you have to do, number one and number two, and it will sort of suck things the right way, hopefully. Um, if you're going on some of the smaller uh, um, spacecrafts, like uh, like uh, the Galactic or indeed um, the Blue Origin one, uh, there are no toilets on board, um, so you better do your stuff 
before you go and and after you come back. And if you're really prone to uh, having to go quite often, I would suggest uh, wearing a nappy. There are indeed big astronaut nappies uh, that, that are <laughs> made for that, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, listen, we've ran out of time, but I definitely want to have you come back on because we are going to be doing our regular space travel series. And you, my friend, are definitely the perfect contributor. So I can't wait to have you come back on soon. It's been a great pleasure. Have a, have a great uh, 2022. There you go. 2020. Two is right here and we're happy new year's new year's day everybody that was pure wimmer astronaut definitely check out his stuff you can go on the internet at wimmer space or check him out on the gram at peer.wimmer you're listening to a moment of zen right here on 710 wr the voice of new york we'll be right back after this